Conflicts around the world are starting to escalate and it's clear that the geopolitical situation is getting no better, spilling off into the financial markets. Cryptocurrencies are plunging this weekend, Wall Street futures are set to open in the red and commodities could go bonkers. So which markets do we need to be looking at? Today we break down this week of earnings season and the big news stories and levels that you need to be watching, including stocks, cryptos, the volatility increases, commodities, and of course, the biggest earnings. Let's go through it all right now. There's so much to cover, and this week is going to be huge. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the special weekend edition of the Markets Around the World. My name's Tom, and as per usual, we'll be covering everything from the latest data, macro, news stories, and of course, key levels that you need to be watching. If you love markets like we do, remember to subscribe and help better educate yourself about how these markets actually work together. So let's talk about what happened on the Friday, and then we'll go into what's happening this weekend, because Wall Street futures are starting to freak out in a big way. Let's go through the big story, though. It was inflation-based trades, vol-based trades, and of course, inversing the market that was really in focus last week. And if you take a look at what happened actually during the Friday event, markets started to turn a little bit defensive throughout the session. What really was interesting, though, isn't actually shown on this chart. After the close, every single one of the major commodities spiked across the board in after-hours trade. And that was due to the geopolitical tensions around the world and basically what could be considered a huge escalation of world problems. So the weekend Wall Street trade is now on and you can see here that people are starting to sell it and basically the market is set to gap almost 1% at the time of this recording to the downside. Just a quick reminder, if you haven't already followed us over on X, please do so as we've posted over there some of the big charts that we'll be using in today's video along with the key levels for the S&P 500 this week. And you'll notice straight away, it could be that we're opening around 50, 50, 50, 60, which you will notice is a pretty important options level on Monday. New York Stock Exchange. Now let's talk volume ratios because it was a second nine to one down day without any intervening nine to one up day for the markets. Now, this is not really a great look. In fact, it's one of the worst things that we've seen in some time. And with the percentage of stocks underneath some of their own moving averages and making new highs across the board from the New York Stock Exchange, you can clearly see that this market's teetering on the edge of potentially a bigger correction. When we take a look at the new moving average heat map from S&P 500 and 600 small caps, you'll notice that the percent of small caps above their 50-day actually dropped to less than 50% for the first time in a little while. And this is showing you an inherent weakness within smalls, mids, and what's starting to appear in the large caps. If that continues to escalate, then we could be looking at that 5 to maybe even 10% pullback that we've talked about is a theoretical example in election years. When we go over to the S&P 1500 new highs versus new lows, you'll notice here that things are starting to really turn around. Over the last 10 days, we only had 61 stocks making new highs, whereas we had 421 stocks making new lows. Now, that's a big change when you consider where we were only a few weeks ago from that breadth standpoint. And of course, the VIX or the volatility market has been jumping as well. Now, if the VIX jumps above 20, which I would think is going to happen throughout the Monday session, this changes the stats quite a bit. But when we go from a calm kind of point all the way to 17 very clearly or closely, you'll notice that really it's usually short-lived. And actually, the stats are not necessarily that negative for the markets moving forward with most of the max losses within that kind of correction territory, except for, of course, 2020 with the pandemic breakout. So what else has been happening? Well, we know that moving averages for the general broad market haven't been good for a while. And if you've really been following the materials sector and the energy sector, geopolitical nightmares like what we're in right now are actually pretty good for those particular trades. We also know that when you look at the rest of the market, real estate, utilities, consumer discretionary and healthcare haven't really been coming along. And as of recently, other than the MAG7 stocks, a lot of the technology sector has also been weakening. So it's been a while since we've talked about this particular indicator, but it has to be brought up in this weekend video. And the reason why? Well, the bullish percent index has actually dropped below 65. Now, when this happens we know something serious is starting to occur in markets. 
In general, when we go from a rotation to an 80 plus and then we sell underneath 65, it means a correction is coming. And if you're not familiar, a correction is kind of between that kind of 5 and 10% pullback in markets. At the time of this recording, we're about 2.8% to 2.9% down overall. So could we be going into a correction territory? Well, the bullish percent index is certainly signifying that. And of course, the percentage of stocks above some of their moving averages is also starting to show weakness across the board. Only 15.4 on the reading above the 20 moving average and 44 above the 50. Now, I love the 50 in particular. And if the market does manage to get down into that 30 to 20 range, this can be a level where some technical analysts and people that are looking to invest may be going, what's the Ford PE? Does this market look like it's hit a big level? Because that can be a bit of an exciting point for people that are looking for towards the bull side for the rest of the year. So what about gold? I thought I'd just quickly bring this stat up. It was a big focus of our previous video. And we talked about how gold over the next year only tends to go up when we see this particular read. 17.1% annualized return when we have an overbought market like this. So let's jump into the charts and boy, oh boy, do we have a lot coming up later on as well in today's video, along with where we're at in terms of the cycle. But you'll notice here that the S&P 500 was a really interesting Friday. The most traded zone was fully respected. Markets sold directly into the put support, which sat around 5,100 and 5,175 was effectively gapped below, forcing the negative gamma situation to become a big thing and markets to move straight down. Hedges had to come in and basically start to sell the market to get rid of some of their risk going into the weekend. We also know that we've got gaps everywhere. One of the big levels that a lot of people will be looking at is 59.80 for the week ahead, just in case we get down there, as that also lines in fairly well with the weekly 20 moving average. And if you know anything about mean reversion, you would know that we really should be hitting this zone at some point soon. To have a market going ballistic without at least one weekly 20 moving average hit is very unusual. And if you go through really long-term history of markets, you'll notice that this is a fairly normal hit throughout any major bull cycle. It just hasn't happened for so long right now. So could it right realistically be about to occur? Well, we mentioned that the markets are probably going to gap open on the Monday and that between 50.50 and 50.65 is where we have major put support or a put wall. Now, if this level is broken throughout the Monday session, get ready for further flash crashing because in a negative gamma situation, which basically means that the market needs to hedge towards the downside, that's going to be a huge deal. But we will have quite a few gaps because what happened actually through the session on Friday was we gapped below and we left a 5,200 gap on the upside. A break above 5,200, 5,250 for this week, although it seems unlikely at this stage, if it did happen, we'd be going into a massive gamma squeeze to the upside. But that doesn't seem to be likely as we have 5,175 to contend with, 5,200 gap on the resistance, the 5,150 most traded zone as well. So this level is fairly stacked towards bear side and the chance of opening on this gap. So even if we do get a rally throughout the session, all of these levels are going to act as potential for the bears to really push back. Now from the bull zone, where are dollar cost averages going to start to like the market? Well, we don't know because of course the market hasn't created any downward structure yet, but you'll notice that we have that major gap between 49.60 and 49.80 and the weekly 20 moving average there. And I've also outlined one of the major zones, which of course a lot of people would like, between the 47 and 4,800. Now, with all of the risks going on in the world, it can be quite scary. But just remember, you know, if you're looking at the longer term, you've got to put it into the situation of what is more likely to occur in what has realistically been a fairly big bullish market. It can be quite scary, but we'll be, of course, following it along with you across the way. So make sure to sub if you're interested in that type of stuff. So the market's been making a series of lower lows and lower highs, unless that really sequence changes We've got to be on the kind of short-term bearish side, long-term bullish side, and we'll explain that a little bit using these options here. This week is not only earning season kickoff in a major way with Netflix, but it's also a major week of big news and, of course, geopolitical tensions. So with the OPEX coming as well as that, what do we not have? Well, we've pretty much got everything. So 50-60, 50-50 is where we have the puts. 
Now, this will act as that major kind of bounce zone you would think throughout the markets. But if they do manage to get below this through the Monday trade, get ready for quite a lot of negativity and potential of a bit of a flash crash, which can set up, you know, anywhere between one and three, even 4% moves towards the downside, getting into that corrective territory if that does occur. On the 16th, we know 5,100 is the major put wall. So we're already probably going to be trading underneath that as of the open. And there's still quite a lot of strikes in the negative gamma. 5,200 would need to be broken above for us to get back into that kind of positive gamma style switch. And that probably is not going to happen based on the charts that we've seen at this point. What about the 19th though, the OPEX? Well, look at all the puts starting to stack up. Now, 5,000 is the big zone. Again, we talked about 4980, 4960, 20 weekly moving average. This level will be a big one because if the markets get underneath there, they may want to close above 5,000 to really not pay out those options during the week. And it really depends on how things are starting to position into that trading session. And there's going to be a lot of updates coming on our X account for the key zones for the S&P each and every day as we go through what is going to be this vol week. Now, where we already tipped off to this, well, it turns out the CTAs might be completely correct. We know that was super long and they moved towards the short end realistically at the early part last week in terms of what they were doing. Now, if you're not familiar with CTAs, Commodity Trade Advisors, they tend to be systematic funds and they often are early to the sell party and they can help us gain a little bit of edge on when we should be buying into the market and of course selling the markets. And while we'll be updating you throughout this point, it does make sense for them to get into some kind of harmony here, maybe get back to around this ratio. So you can see here that the S&P 500 sell-off actually escalated on the Friday with more CTAs selling into these markets. So it's a big deal what they're doing right now. On the flip side of that, the Brent one continues to be pretty strong. So price action has been strong on, of course, oil, but CTAs have also been buying in a big way. So we're, of course, tracking that at all times. As you can see here, the sentiment for risk on, risk off was already selling us, telling us that maybe it was a little bit risky to be in markets at these points in terms of entering to longer term positions. And it didn't really make sense. But if this gets back into the opportunity side and it can happen pretty quickly, then that could be a pretty good sign in this market to be going towards the long. And again, we'll update that when necessary. In terms of S&P 1500, you'll notice here, it's a bit hard to see, but pretty much all the sectors were starting to decrease throughout last week. And this is because we had those 80% sell-off days. And on top of that, we also didn't have very good news from the inflation story with most central banks Um, It's not looking towards maybe as many cuts. And of course, the economists out there saying, well, we're looking at less cuts across the board, possibility of only one rate cut throughout the year, maybe two for 2024. Remember, that was sitting at like five at one point. For this week's earnings, it starts big with Goldman Sachs, banks coming in pretty poorly, JP Morgan selling off 6.5% throughout the Friday session. And we've got major banks coming on the Mondays and the Tuesdays, but most people will be discussing the Netflix trade, which is coming after the close on Thursday, kicking off this year, this particular quarter's overall earnings season from the tech side. And look at the expected volatility from the options market. They're thinking it's going to be a plus or minus 9% move in Netflix. There is no doubt that day traders, people that are reactionary, instead of maybe predictive for some of these major earnings, could be looking at some incredible vol throughout this earnings season. And I think it's going to be a very exciting earnings from the perspective of day traders, scalpers, and maybe even some swing traders. Netflix, though, plus minus nine, please be aware of your risks leading into any one of these earnings announcements. As if you don't know what's going to happen and something gaps up 25% or down 25% against you, that's going to really hurt your account. And I'd hate to see anybody lose like that in these events. S&P 500 election years, is this a point where we tend to sell off? Well, of course, yes, we have the geopolitical tensions. We've got the raise, the interest rates, and of course, the inflation story. But do remember, it is pretty normal for us to potentially sell off here. We're currently tracking 12 and 76. We're sitting around here at this point. And you'll notice in both cases, we tend to see pullbacks around this time, let by rallies into the rest of the year. Most of the stats still kind of point towards that potentially happening. We are in a cyclical longer-term bull market. Cyclical longer-term bull markets tend to lead for quite some time, and pullbacks are generally going to be met by that kind of bull demand across the board. 
We can also see when we overlay a couple of these periods, it's not unusual for this particular time to find risks. And while you might say, well, this time's totally different, I would say, well, there's some evidence there that looks pretty compelling. What about the S&P 500 in terms of dark pool activity? Well, there was a big one actually right on the close. And this is the 3X fund, SPXL. And you'll notice there was a huge dark pool activity right on the close. Now, that could be a sell. Maybe it's a buy. What I like to look at is this level and seeing whether the market actually regains that zone. Because if it does regain that zone, it could push back up to number 16 here, which would be around 130 and I think around 5,200 on the market. So you'll notice that we're probably going to gap down. But if we do end up rallying, 5,200 is going to be a very pivotal point for these markets, especially from the bull side. And of course, if the bears can keep controlling that series of lower highs. Now, let's get into some further charts here. And of course, we'll cover the crypto market as that was pretty wild getting down to 60 on Bitcoin, but the Ethereum market actually is even more interesting. Let's go to the VIX start off here, 17 closure, highest all year, big level, tends to be when we kind of lead into this that we do end up getting a 20 read. So we're probably going into more volatility for the week ahead and the VIX is going to be alive again. When we have a look here at the percentage of overall bond options in terms of what's going on with the options and high yield, you'll notice it did spike back up. If this goes bonkers, throughout the Monday's trade, then of course we know that the risks are getting pretty serious on markets. And we also know this tends to be in line with those more corrective moves. So we'll be watching that one. Look forward to that on the Monday close video. Central banks around the world didn't do much. They basically were just holding firm throughout the week. US equity yields. So in terms of yields across the board, we can see 4.5 and 4.9 are the major yield zones. They did drop off a little bit. But this is because, you know, this isn't just the story that's going on in these markets. What about junk bonds, though? Well, risks did start to increase. And you'll notice here the junk bonds ended up closing the week between that 77, 76. Now, if you've watched a few of our videos, you would know that between this zone is actually pretty important. And what's been happening is that there are a lot of puts that are sitting between 76 and 77. If the market continues to sell off, they may need to be hedged. And if that occurs, then we might see a bit of a flash in junk bonds. Now, that can lead into, again, a bit more panic in markets. So it's one that we're watching. For the US dollar, for anyone that was looking at the bull side, you would have been incredibly happy with the trade. Look at this thing, just absolutely smashing into our next zone. 105.80 hit, achieved, done within only a matter of a couple of sessions. Next stop, potentially 107. Although we are at what I would think is a take profit, 107 would be the next zone for the dollar and continue to watch this. Remember, in times of freak out in the markets and freak out in the world, the US dollar is considered a partial safe haven. So that's why it moves so quickly. What about copper? Yeah, copper will probably spike, but you can see it's also come up to a little bit of a high. Now, they call it Dr. Copper and I'm very bullish on it for the rest of the year and the next couple of years. But copper is going to you know, be around this tight zone. And you'd also see it in gold. Gold actually struggled there a little bit. And you might think that's counterintuitive because shouldn't gold be rallying like a lot of these other metals? Um, yeah, I don't know about that. So gold tends to not be as good as you would think against conflict in the world. And I can see this being actually a bit of consolidation for gold. Now, I do think gold will be long. Don't get me wrong. Six months, 12 months, 18 months. I've been a long-time proponent of the 3K figure uh, happening for this, but I would be starting to get a little bit careful on gold because gold versus the US dollar, if the US dollar starts to really pick up due to the the conflicts in the world, then gold may struggle a little bit versus the US. And you can see the increased volume and the potential of this massive wick. Now, we've seen massive wicks like this before. We know they tend to bring into consolidation. It's nowhere near as easy to read as this one over here on the left-hand side but I would be a little bit cautious on the gold trade. Let's have a look here at Alcoa. Now, I just bought this one up because it has aluminium and look at the spike in after hours trade. So this is after hours trade. It actually spiked 6.9% and it was across the board. So many of these metals, so many precious metals, rare earth minerals, anything was spiking up big and Wall Street was buying into those near the close. So it's something that we'll be looking at this week, and it seems to be the general storyline that we've really seen underneath the markets for the last month, that sector rotation we've been following. Make sure to get into the sectors because the sectors are where it's at the next couple of years. Silver versus gold, silver still relatively cheap, but struggling versus gold throughout the Friday session. 
Long term, still looking at the 0.013, but silver did suffer after having a stellar outperformance. US oil, on the other hand, though, may do okay in the coming week. We know that we had that huge bounce. We actually had a horrible sell coming into the close. So look at this. So mark out your 8760 zone because if we get above that, you would think that we're going towards 92 per the barrel. But have a look at this thing here. So it was a massive sell. We actually really liked market pickups from here. If you did manage to pick it up and take a little bit of profit there, well done. This weekend's going to be really interesting to see how it ends up trading. But that's a fairly negative sign generally on markets. I'd like to see another wick bounce off the 85 to 85.50. So where we are right now, it needs to bounce. It needs to bounce quickly. If it manages to close under 84.50, even though you might think oil has to go up, it might actually come down. It's I think those rare earth minerals and metals, those ones are particularly looking a little bit more towards the bull side. Now let's jump over to a couple of the individual stocks and then we'll go into the major indices as well. JP Morgan here, just bad. 6.47, market didn't like it. Realistically, the whole world wasn't liking Friday and the earnings just kind of exacerbated that. This is probably the pullback that needed to occur for this bank and for major banks out there. And I'm not really too concerned about it. I think that we're probably going lower. 170 seems to be a good little level to look for JP Morgan. And we'll be kind of watching these banks and how they react. Because if the financials kind of drop off, that kind of again shows you that correction could be in play. Meanwhile, Nvidia actually held very well. And it didn't really even come down to the major first support, which is 867. Although I'd expect that to be hit throughout the Monday session. So again, here, going to be a pivotal little point for the short-term bulls on NVIDIA. And if NVIDIA manages to get below 830, as we've talked about, 786 becomes a real level and possibility of even the bigger correction, which is 680. Now, I don't think it's going to happen for 680, but if it did, that would be a really cool zone to be watching. What about Apple? So you might say, well, how can Apple go up when everything else is going down? It's because markets must be invested. So all these funds, they have to be invested somewhere. So they tend to jump into underperforming quality stocks during times of kind of sell-offs. And you can see here, Apple is getting that treatment with the big support holding. Most traded zone though, now coming into focus. This has been where you've seen previous selling. So I would say that Apple's little kind of rally has gone through and I'd expect it to maybe chop through this area for now. Another one is Tesla that's been doing the same thing. It held pretty well considering through the Friday and you'll notice that it's chopping around between 160 buyers and 175 to 180 sellers. Getting through 185, that's going to be a big deal for Tesla on the horizon. Let's have a look at some of the major market indices. The Aussie 200, this one's not going to suffer as much as the S&P 500 will uh, because it's a lot of energy, a lot of metals, a little bit of financials, so they won't do very well either. Uh, and you probably think that 7,600 is the major support for the Aussie market. Same thing for the FTSE. They've both been doing quite well. The German market, on the other hand, really suffering here. Pretty bad weekly close. You'd think that the DAX might even have further selling. It's not new. And this just shows you the undercurrent of the markets. As we talked about before, the percentage of stocks above the 20 moving average, that's actually quite low. So if you don't have those big, magnificent seven stocks, the market internals don't look as good. And the German 40 or the DAX is showing that same thing. Even the Chinese market could not hold up through all of this news. And it's a little bit disappointing from this trade. Now, I would have thought 17,000 would have bought us 18,000. Of course, you can't really necessarily predict, predict geopolitical tensions on the day or anything like that. But you'll notice here that we're still kind of just barely holding on to some of the trend lines that some people will be watching. For me, it's not really the trend line. I'm going to be looking more at this low and seeing how the market interacts with that. I'm not so interested if it takes the low. I want to know whether it finds buyers straight away. So we'll be watching. And of course, I'm still bullish overall on the Chinese market if you're looking at a longer term position. Now, let's go over to the US 2K. What is going on here? So the US 2K, very weak, back down to the weekly 20 moving average, almost below 2,000 into the close and a new low being formed. Not a good closure for the US 2K. You would think that basically pickups are going to be met by sell demand. That overall ascending channel, of course, getting weakened against. And you can see here it's been selling and nothing really looking too good on this one. So the US 2K, possible buys to be met by sells. When you look at the queues, they didn't break underneath the zone. So again, we've got a gap fill here at 425 on the queues, but I want to look at the futures 
just to point out the key zone. We didn't break underneath 17,780. So until that happens, the queues are still kind of in a bullish market and they're just consolidating. So it's still a pullback in time, which is a pullback in itself. We still have not seen a squeeze, which of course was only going to happen if we get through 18.4. And I'd say we're in the middle of nowhere land at this point. So for bulls, they're going to try to defend 17.8. And for bears, they're just going to want to see this thing move underneath so that they can get some of those gap fill zones. And I think a lot of people will be looking for that. Let's move over now to the crypto market because this is trading as we record. And you'll notice here that Bitcoin is not in a good shape. 63,000, it bounced down to 61, which is the bottom of our red box here. And we saw that, that bite off. I don't like it here. Now, we're still in a trapped market, but as I've said a few times, oh, I'm very, very skeptical of it here because if it does manage to get through this zone, there's nothing holding it up in terms of ledgers on this side. So there's almost no volume really that went through here. That could lead to a flash crash in crypto and 51.8, 56, so 50,600. These levels become really the possibilities for the crypto market. That would actually give us that negative kind of 29, 30% sell-off. And actually that's perfectly normal in a bullish movement. So into the halving event, this would not be unusual to see it happen. This is an important zone though. For some people, they're going to love buying this area. I'm a bit skeptical. We'll see whether it does end up holding out. And you can see here on the weekly, the weekly close will also be important. Can it actually hold these lows? So bulls need to hold the 63 zone. I've said that quite a few times. We'll find out whether they can manage to do it. All right, let's move over to Ethereum. So that's even weaker. And we're at that key trade zone. Actually, Ethereum has made a new low. So you'll notice that while Bitcoin's holding the 60,000, kind of zone as well as it can, Ethereum hasn't been doing that. Ethereum actually broke to a new low and it's at the most traded level two, which I've had on the charts. And if Bitcoin does manage to get hit really bad, then of course, where is Ethereum going? I think the flash crash would push it to around 2,200. You might think that is insane, but it's pretty normal again in the crypto world. If you traded it for quite a few years, you didn't know exactly what is possible. That would actually take the percentage down for this one to about 45. And again, you might think that's impossible, but yeah, it's, it's again, pretty normal. So the alt's definitely suffering here. Uh, Ethereum is already 30% down. For some longer term bulls, they're going to love this level. Uh, but yeah, like anything, you've got to kind of control your risks and know what you're doing. So not enough structure here on the small timeframes yet but we'll continue to watch that storyline. For the week ahead, we've got core retail sales for the US coming out on Monday before the market opens. So that'll be an interesting one to watch. Then we've got Fed Chair Powell coming to annoy us later on this week uh, and talk at 1.15 p.m. New York time. Plenty of different FOMC members and Bank of England and central banks around the world. And then we have unemployment claims as well coming in on Thursday. But I really think the storyline is mostly about the earnings and the geopolitical tension. So make sure to subscribe to the channel, follow along, comment down below what you're looking at potentially buying this week, if anything, and follow us on the socials as well, because there is a lot going on and you're going to need to be informed. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend. Hopefully everybody is safe out there and we'll see you next week. And we'll see you very soon.